Hello, my name is Sophie Llewellyn-Smith and I'm very pleased to have been invited to talk to you today about a topic which I think is very interesting and that is how you can have a, an attitude or a mindset that is most conducive to learning when you're training to be an interpreter. And I'm going to use a term that you may or may not have heard before which is the term growth mindset. I have been a, a conference interpreter for nearly 25 years now and I've been a, an interpreting trainer for 15 years and it seems to me that when we think about interpreter training we very often focus on the acquisition of skills. Um, we talk about acquiring note-taking, we discuss the best ways to help students learn to do consecutive without notes or we talk about troubleshooting when people first do simultaneous for example. But there is a, an other side to the coin when you're training as an interpreter, and that is not the acquisition of skills, but the whole psychology, uh, the learning environment, and how you can have a mindset that allows you to learn effectively. And the reason I'm talking about this is that throughout the years I've seen all kinds of students. I've seen students who started the course with pretty strong skills already, and a lot of talent, but who plateaued part way through the course. Or I've seen students who've started out with significant weaknesses in one area or another, for example, their use of mother tongue wasn't particularly good, uh, or they weren't great public speakers, but they've made massive improvements over the course of one or two years. And often the difference uh, is not to do with their ability or their intelligence, it's their psychology and the mindset and how they react to the feedback that they get during interpreting classes. And if you don't have the right mindset for learning, I think the risk is that you can get frustrated, for example, if you don't progress as quickly as you would like to, or if you're comparing yourselves to others in the class and you think you're not making progress as quickly as they are, you can get frustrated and then you give up. Or I've seen uh, quite a few students and professional interpreters, uh, myself included, who sometimes sabotage themselves, consciously or unconsciously. For example, you may be the kind of interpreter who when you do simultaneous and there's something that you don't understand or something that you didn't catch, you have the little voice, <laughs> not the voice of the speaker that's coming into your headphones, but your own little voice going, oh, I just missed a word. Oh, I didn't understand that sentence. Uh, it's all going horribly wrong. And then before you know it, it does go horribly wrong and you spiral into uh, a simultaneous that doesn't work very well. Uh, or I've also seen a lot of students, and I would say more in the past five to ten years probably, who experience stress or anxiety and that is the way that they respond to their classes and to the feedback they're getting and to their own judgment of their progress and that obviously can have a huge impact on their exam performance for example at the end of the year at university or if they're trying to pass an accreditation test with an international organization nerves and stress are one of the main reasons why people fail or underperform uh, and Mindset can also feed into a fear of failure. And if you fear failure, you don't really want to put yourself out there. <laughs> you don't want to stick your neck out and take risks. And so then you stagnate. If you're worried that you're going to do something badly and you think it's disastrous if you make mistakes or if you do things badly, you just don't try anymore or you give up on things that you're not good at and you stagnate. So those are some of the risks if you have a mindset that is not conducive to learning. And a mindset of that type is what I would call a fixed mindset by contrast with a growth mindset. The whole theory of growth mindsets was first developed and investigated by a psychologist called Carol Dweck in 1998. Uh, she's a professor of psychology at Stanford University and since she first started working on the theory of growth mindsets a lot of research has been done much of it it has to be said on school children but there has also been some research on undergraduates and the results show that if you have a growth mindset and I'll explain that in more detail in a moment you are more likely to develop grit and 
resilience so that you can better cope with setbacks in your life, you can better cope with changes, with different situations, all the kinds of things that we encounter as interpreters. A growth mindset also fosters what are known as pro-social behaviours, which means behaviours which are good for the community as a whole. And growth mindsets also have very significant mental health benefits. You're less likely to suffer from depression and anxiety if you have a growth mindset. What does it mean then? <laughs> what is a fixed mindset and what is a growth mindset? All of us at some point in our lives have either had a fixed mindset about certain things or encountered the idea of a fixed mindset, which is that there are certain skills and abilities that are innate and that are difficult or impossible to change. For example, intelligence, the idea that you have a certain IQ and that's basically it. But you can apply that also to things like musical ability. A lot of people will say, I'm tone deaf or uh, I'm not musical at all. Or the ability to dance. How many times have you heard people say, I've got two left feet and I'm a rubbish dancer? We, of course, are interested in interpreting. And on the interpreting front, I hear quite a lot of fixed mindset thinking, both from students and from colleagues and from trainers. I'll hear things like, I'm terrible with numbers, or my notes are rubbish, or I can't do simultaneous, I always miss the beginning of the next sentence. Uh, and I'm sure you have heard people say things like that before. That, those are all examples of a fixed mindset, the idea that you have a certain ability or, or skill and that's it, you can't change it. Even in interpreting you'll hear plenty of people say, um, interpreters are born and not made, as though you have a talent for interpreting the same way that you have a talent for being an Olympic sprinter or something, uh, and that's it, not everybody can do it forgetting the fact that even the Olympic sprinter has to put in years and years and years of training to improve their skills. A growth mindset, on the other hand, is the idea that actually all of these things are trainable and improvable. You may all start from different levels and you may never reach the same level. We're not all going to be Olympic athletes, but there is always something that you can improve. And so in a growth mindset, you can develop skills with hard work, effective strategies and help when you need it, the right kind of help when you need it. I want to look at some of the ways that you can try to shift your own mindset if you think that you're guilty of some fixed mindset thinking and we all are at certain times, often when we're under stress or we have to do something new. So let me talk about some of the things that are characteristic of uh, fixed and growth mindsets and how you can try to shift towards a growth mindset. The first important point I want to make is that growth and development, not just in interpreting but in yourself, in other skills, in other areas of your life, cannot happen in your comfort zone. <laughs> because by definition, the place where you feel comfortable is where you've already mastered the skills. But uh, if you've already mastered the skills, you don't need to grow and develop. If you could already interpret perfectly, then you wouldn't need to be on a course to learn to interpret. And by the way, no one can interpret perfectly anyway. <laughs> so the point I'm trying to make is that growing and developing and improving require some discomfort because you have to get out of your comfort zone by definition. So that's the first point to make. The next is about your inner dialogue, in other words, how you speak to yourself and, and to others about your abilities and your progress. Is there a way that you can shift some of these fixed mindset ideas, for example, I'm rubbish at numbers or I can't do consecutive, into something more growth mindset-esque that allows for the possibility of improvement? A simple way that you can do that is to try to see whether you can use the words yet or still when you speak about your development. For example, I haven't fully mastered note taking yet, or I'm still working on managing my stress. 
in difficult situations. Uh, and it's a simple thing to do, to put in the word yet or still, but it allows room for growth in a way that some of the other sentences don't. Uh, and it's useful also to remind yourself of growth mindset principles and to say things like, I am learning, I have only just begun note taking, if I practice I will improve. It is normal to make mistakes at this stage uh, and also what strategies can I usefully apply to improve my performance. Now I want to talk a little bit about ability versus process. Quite a lot of research has been done, again, usually on school children, looking at how they react depending on the type of praise they get. In one study, two groups of school children were compared. Some of them were praised on their performance in a particular maths test based on ability. Oh, you're so smart, you got such a good score. And the other group was praised based on the process, the effort that they put in the work that they put in and the progress that they made. The interesting finding from this kind of study is that uh, the young people who are praised on ability for being smart and for doing well uh, afterwards don't like putting themselves in situations where they might fail, where they might do badly, because that would conflict with their image of themselves and the image they have portrayed to other people as being intelligent. So they don't want to do anything that's going to destroy that image of being good at things and being intelligent. Whereas the children who are praised for the process and for the effort that they put in are more likely to take risks, to be willing to go out of their comfort zone, to try out new things. And to me that's a really important point to make about learning because you can't learn to interpret overnight. There are difficult moments, difficult transitions. You have to learn by doing. You can't pick up simultaneous overnight, for example, and sometimes you have to try different techniques. Oh, today I'm going to try salami technique. Um, and so it's very important to be in that mindset of uh, having a willingness to experiment. And hand in hand with that goes a willingness to make mistakes. Now this is one that I find particularly difficult. I hate making mistakes. Most people do. Uh, and I'll give you a very simple example from my life. Years ago I learned to drive and I passed my driving test first time. At least a year later, because I didn't have a car of my own to practice on, my boyfriend uh, went on holiday with me and said, why don't you drive the car today? I drove his car and I hit something. <laughs> and I was so traumatized by this that I developed a driving phobia that lasted 12 years. I think that's a, an incredible illustration of the power of the psyche, that my mind basically met, went, uh, you did something really badly and you made a horrible mistake, so now you're just not going to do that thing anymore for years. And I, I had a genuine phobia of driving, I could not do it, my spatial awareness was completely shot. So none of us like making mistakes, but it's really important to distinguish between high risk environments for making mistakes and low risk environments. In a high risk environment, let's say, uh, you're interpreting at the Council of Ministers at the European Union. You don't want to make mistakes because you're being web streamed, your colleagues are listening to you, it's a very high profile meeting and there's a lot at stake. Or let's say you're working uh, on, at a private conference for a new client. You don't want to make mistakes in the booth because you might never be invited back or offered another contract. So obviously there are some times in your life when you want to play it safe and you particularly don't want to make mistakes. But there are many other situations where making a mistake is, is low risk. A learning environment like the classroom is one of those situations. If you make a mistake, what will happen? Nobody dies for a start. It's not like being a surgeon where if you make a mistake somebody might die or be horribly injured. Nobody died, you're not going to lose your job. Really, the risk is very low. The only thing that is at stake is your pride and your self-image and how you look to other people. So I would encourage you to view mistakes in that kind of setting 
as an opportunity to improve. You will see that athletes, for example, will go and look at the tape of their hockey match or their basketball match to see what went wrong and where they made mistakes so that they can then drill that for next time. Professional musicians, if they make a mistake in the symphony, will go back and play that part of the piece over and over again to try and avoid the mistake next time. So why is it that we see making mistakes or interpreting a speech badly, in inverted commas, as a bad thing in a classroom situation? On the contrary, we should see it as an opportunity to diagnose an area where we have a weakness and to then work on that area. Mistakes are an opportunity to improve. I have just a few more points to make. One is about comparing oneself to other people. I think it's really important to remember that we progress at different rates and it's not necessarily very productive to compare yourself to other people. They started in a different place with different strengths and weaknesses and they're moving at a different rate which may not be linear. What's more important is to look at your arc where your progress is. Are you working as hard as you could? Are you applying effective strategies? If not, can you try something different for a while? Or indeed, can you learn strategies from the people in your class who are working effectively and successfully? That's where comparing yourself to other people can be useful if you can learn strategies from them. Um, but otherwise, it's not very productive to go, oh, she can, she can do simultaneously really well and I can't. So what? <laughs> Compare yourself with yourself uh, to see whether you're doing the things you need to do. Now, a point about judgment. Often I find that in interpreting classes at university, students are evaluating their own performance in terms of, I was terrible today, I did it well or I did it badly. Again, there's an element of judgment in there which can be quite dangerous. I think there's nothing wrong with being analytical and assessing your own performance, but you also have to be able to see it in context. What is expected of you at this stage of the year and what are your objectives at this stage of the year? Uh, so rather than going for that fixed mindset and judgmental idea of I did it badly, I am bad at it, I think of it in terms of what could I be expected to achieve at this stage, am I applying the right strategies, have I done as much as I could, if not do I need more help either from my tutor or someone else. So your performance has to be judged in context as opposed to in some kind of absolute term of whether you are a good interpreter or a bad interpreter. Uh, and nearly my last point is about perfectionism. I think there's a lot of perfectionism in today's world. There are also very, a lot of pressures on young people. Uh, when I was growing up, my mother kept telling me I was a perfectionist. And, and she used to say, you're a perfectionist like me. And listening to her over the years, I can see that she actually thinks that perfectionism is a good thing because she sees it as setting a high standard and trying to meet that standard. But over the years, my understanding of perfectionism has become rather different from that because I think perfectionism can often set you up for failure. It can mean that you have very unrealistic expectations of what you should achieve and how much work you should do. And if you don't manage it, then you're constantly beating yourself up about it and you're never good enough. And in extreme cases, it can mean that you give up on things because you think you're not doing them well enough. And there are many things in my life that I have just stopped doing because I couldn't do them brilliantly straight away. So I just went, I'm not doing that. <laughs> and I missed out on a lot of opportunities through that kind of perfectionism because perfectionism goes hand in hand with fear of failure, which is something I was talking about at the beginning. Uh, if you have a growth mindset, you leave room for growth and development as opposed to thinking I can either be good at something or not good at something. No, you can be somewhere between the two moving towards being good at it and there's value in that in itself. So I just want to recap really and go back to 
uh, my definition of a growth mindset. I hope that you've got more of a feel for it uh, now that I've been talking through some individual points. A growth mindset is about developing skills and abilities through hard work. It's worth doing a little SWOT analysis of your interpreting skills and seeing where your strengths and weaknesses are and then making yourself a little action plan and seeing what you need to prioritize and what you need to work on. Hard work, effective strategies. If your current strategies aren't working, experiment. The classroom is the place to do that. Once you're out in the real world working for a client, you don't necessarily want to be experimenting with a different technique like summarizing more or editing more or using more salami technique or what have you. So the classroom is the time to do that. And finally, getting help when you need it. That might be from your tutor, if you're an interpreting student, or it might be through trying to find a mentor, or it might be online materials that you find helpful. Uh, for example, Skik's Knowledge Center, or Orsit, or Skik Train. There are quite a lot of interpreting resources out there now where you can get some advice. Uh, and I would conclude by mentioning a free growth mindset challenge that you can have a go at if you're interested. You will find it on my website, which is theinterpretingcoach.com. And if you scroll down the home page, there's a section called free resources where there is a growth mindset challenge. And you can click to join that and you will receive seven days worth of emails with more information about what a growth mindset is and with a worksheet every day that you can download and fill in to try out some little interactive exercises uh, to, to challenge your mindset and see whether you can shift a little from a more fixed mindset to a more open growth mindset. I hope that you found my little talk today interesting and I invite you to think about your own mindset uh, and to move towards a growth mindset if you can. Thank you.